folks, this is Pastor Mike Hogger coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. I was watching the news this week. The news comment, local news commentators in the St. Louis area, they're going, isn't it weird that here we have Hurricane Katrina, we have Hurricane Isaac, they cross paths of seven years apart to the day. On the same day, these same hurricanes come to the exact same place, seven years apart, and the news commentators, they're going, wow, isn't that just bizarre? Isn't that weird? It's not. Not when you know a couple things. Number one, uh, what goes on in New Orleans is indicative of what goes on in the rest of America. Number two, when you understand God, when you understand God and what He says and His nature, you see God's handiwork all over this. And there's a inter very, very interesting aspect to Hurricane Isaac, Hurricane Katrina coming to the same place, seven years apart uh, to the day, on the exact same day. What is the significance of it? Is it biblical? <clears throat> Let's find out. And, and you need to understand, uh, when I said what goes on in New Orleans is indicative of what goes on all over America. Um, I, had, I remembered this from back in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina, Category 5 hurricane, goes through New Orleans, Louisiana. I, I had heard about this back then, and it was, uh, it was somebody sent it to me, reminded me of it this time as well. There's a meeting. I don't know if it goes on every year. I think it does. There's a meeting in New Orleans at this time of year, uh, Labor Day weekend. It happens, I think, every year. It's called Southern Decadence. And here's, here's what this, I mean, you look at the, this is their website. You look at the website, you don't have to guess what this is about. You don't, you don't have to go, I wonder what they're doing there. You get it. You understand. And here, ac according to their website, uh, uh, Isaac Storm Update, Southern Decadence Festivities will proceed as scheduled. In other words, not even the hand of God is going to prevent us from being decadent in New Orleans, Louisiana this weekend. No amount of what God's going to do is going to stop us from doing that. That's basically what they said. And, um, you know, it is kind of weird when we have uh, the events like Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Isaac, uh, coming to the same place at the same time, you know, seven years apart on the same day in the exact same place. There are some people who want to say, ah, the government, uh, you know, uh, they can do this and they can do that. Let me remind you of something that uh, we as Bible Christians know and believe. That God is the one who controls the wind. Let me read this scripture to you, Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. The Bible says, And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? We're talking about God, Jesus Christ, who has the ability to bring storms. He has the ability to make them go away. And, and this is the, the issue where Jesus was on the boat with the disciples. And they came to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Well, of course he cares whether or not they perish. He's their Savior. So he simply stands and he says, Peace, be still. And that's all he has to do. His words, the words of God, are the ones that do this. And I just want to take some time this morning, and I want to show you how God works through the whirlwind, what it means. In fact, that's the Bible word for it. The Bible doesn't have tornado or hurricane in it. But it does have the word wind or whirlwind, stormy wind. I want you to think about uh, what happened this year with Hurricane Isaac. Uh, it wasn't so much all the wind damage, although there is some of that, a Category 1 hurricane. But the, it was a slow-moving system, and the amount of rain that came down in one place at one time uh, was more than any sewage system, any backup system that FEMA had, the levees and things like that. It was just more than they could handle. And so I want you to think of, I want you to think of floods. I want you to think of the symbolism of a flood and what God means by that. And we're going to approach this as we look at Scripture this morning. And then there's a, a particular interesting aspect of these two events coming together at the same place on the same day, seven years apart, 
that I think point us to something that is yet to ha something worse than this that's going to happen in the future. Let's look at let's look at the scripture. Psalm chapter 1 verse 4. The Bible says the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. God uses this wind as judgment. Psalm 35 5. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Now I want to stop right here and I want you to see a couple things that we're going to look at. Number one the aspect of God's judgment in, in through the wind, how God sends wind like a whirlwind as a sign or as a form of his judgment upon a people, but also according to Psalm 35, 5, let the angel of the Lord chase them. The spiritual nature of this, the spiritual aspect of this, there are spirits that represent this. In fact, the very word spirit that comes out of my mouth, in Greek in the New Testament, the word would be pneuma. You know what that means? It's breath or wind. In the Old Testament, it's, uh, I can't remember the Hebrew word. But it means the same thing. It means breath or wind. And so we're here we have wind, and we have the word spirit, which devils are spirits, angels are spirits, God is a spirit. And so we have this spiritual nature to especially whirlwind-type things like tornadoes and hurricanes. I want you to think about that. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 27 when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Notice destruction being associated with the whirlwind. Think of the destroyer being associated with the whirlwind. I'm going to show you this. Proverbs 10, 25. As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. Proverbs 11, 29. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. He that troubleth his own house. There is trouble in America. There's trouble being caused by not just this kind of decadence, but the decadence in general of America, the decay, the, the walk away from the scripture, even from churches, from supposedly Christians who are walking away from the truth they are troubling their house, and because of that, they will inherit the wind, the Bible says. That's, that's what God's going to give them for the decadence. Isaiah 26, 16. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs. Think about the prophecy of a travailing woman. So have we been in thy sight, O Lord. Verse 18, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. And so here he's talking about this, he's relating it to this prophecy in the Bible that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall see peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail, upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Think of uh, Anuit Coeptus, Novus Order Seclorum. He favors the birth of a new world order, and that's what this is referring to. There is a birthing taking place, and it brings forth the wind, a spirit, something related to that. Isaiah 41, 16, Thou shalt fan them, and the winds shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. Uh, Jeremiah 22, 22. The wind shall eat up all thy pastors, and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then shalt thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. Notice in these last two verses, you have the whirlwind represent, representing a scattering, a confusion type thing. That's what um, if we were to look in, let's see here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, uh, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. The idea of scattering and uh, confusion and delusion are all related together. It's not knowing something. And there is, a, there is something that's going to be born upon planet Earth, a man, a beast, 
that's going to reign and the people are going to be in confusion. They think that they're worshiping God because he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. They're not worshiping God. They're worshiping the Antichrist. Jeremiah 23, 18. The Bible says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. And if you don't believe in any conspiracy theory at all, you have to believe and understand. Jeremiah 23 applies directly to what's going on in New Orleans right now, what went on five, uh, seven years ago to the day, the southern decadence, the issues that are going on there, and God says it's a grievous whirlwind upon the head of the wicked. And there is nothing more wicked than what's going on right now. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 23. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. There he says it again. Jeremiah 51, 1. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. Here again, God is referring to this wind or this whirlwind as something that brings destruction or is a destroying type thing. For Revelation chapter 9, there is the king of the bottomless pit whose name is Abaddon or Apollyon, Hebrew and Greek. And what does that name mean? Think about it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. Notice the chaos, the disorder, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away and no, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. He's talking about all these last kingdoms of the last days and how they're destroyed by the wind. Now let's look at a different aspect of this. We have, we have the whirlwind representing God's judgment upon the iniquity of mankind. Now we have the whirlwind seen as a, as a symbol of God passing judgment upon the religious speakers, the religious leaders, the rabbis, the priests, the prophets, the pastors, anybody who strays away from the truth and the verity of the word of God, we see the whirlwind coming against them. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine, and the prophets shall become wind, and the word is not in them, thus shall it be done unto them. This is the crowd who says, you can have your best life now. You can have peace and enjoyment and satisfaction and fulfillment in life. You can have all of these things. That's what a lot of preachers are preaching right now. And the Bible says that they have belied the Lord in saying this. And the prophet shall become wind. That's what he said. Benny Hinn, going around to everybody going, and they all fell backwards. Think about it. Think about it. Jeremiah 22, 2, or 22, 22. The wind shall eat up all thy pastors, and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then thou shalt, or shalt thou be ashamed and confounded. There it is again, for all thy wickedness. Job 6, 26. Do you imagine to reprove words and the speeches of one that is desperate, which are as wind? Notice now that he's showing the, the symbolism between what's being said behind the pulpits and the fact that they are as wind. It's almost like the cumulative efforts of all the false preachers, all the pastors, all the prophets, all the religious leaders of the world, all breathing all at the same time and speaking their, their vile against God. Some even going along with Things like Southern Deck and oh, they wouldn't publicly say it. But let's, God loves all people. He wants you to have your best life now, and right now they're living it. And all of their words becoming wind. Job 8 2. How long wilt thou speak these things? Notice the speaking. How long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong 
wind. Hosea chapter 8 verse 6, For from Israel was it also the workmen made it. Therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Talking about idol worship. For they, and I want you to look at verse 7 very carefully. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. They have sown, and I had this verse in my mind all, all uh, week long. I'm trying to think about this hurricane, and I'm going, boy, the, I know the Bible says they shall reap the whirlwind. What did they have to do to reap the whirlwind? And I had it in my mind that they were sowing to the wind. But when you go back and look at what, exactly what the Scripture says, they didn't sow to the wind. They sowed the wind. America sows the seed of false prophecy false ideas, false doctrine. America sows that idea. And because of that, America simply reaps the whirlwind. Now I want you to think of a time of reaping, a time of harvest, a time of gathering, a time when God is going to give America and the world exactly the kind of seed that they sow. We know that uh, seed is like um, there's corruptible seed and incorruptible seed. Here's the, here's the incorruptible seed. It's the Word of God. Here is uh, uh, the Book of Mormon. Here, Dan Brown's Lost Symbol, uh, Morals and Dogma from Albert Pike. These are all corruptible seeds. These are just a representation of that. And as long as they're being sown, what's sown in this country, should we not marvel at the whirlwind that is being reaped right now and it's going to get worse there's something worse coming down the road Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive here again I mean right here the false prophets their wind of doctrine they're sowing their wind of false doctrine and it will turn to be we will be reaping the whirlwind, the effects, the result of that. That's what's going on. Jude chapter 1 verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom it is, is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Notice that with the false prophets come the wandering stars, the spiritual forces, the devils, the evil angels, the Bible refers to them, the fallen angels. Um, they are all part of this last day's event that's happening, the whirlwind. And again, we ain't seen nothing yet, but we will. And I, man, I just, you know, you hate to just say, oh, this is of God. Well, I believe it is because God controls the wind. And when I see something like this going on, two hurricanes, seven, you have to think, you have to ask yourself, is there anything in the Bible that has to do with like seven years or seven times? You have to think about that for a minute. And to the day, these two end up in the exact same place, seven years apart. I just think this, I think God is trying to show America and the world something from this book. That's what I think. Um, I mentioned earlier that this whirlwind, we see the doctrine. It represents spirits, um, wandering stars. It represents evil angels or, or God's destructive angels and so on. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 26, look at this. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Look at the language here. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow. The light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Are you kidding me? This world, this hurricane, 
you stop to think about yourself looking at the land uh, when this hurricane passes through. You have the darkness, you have the wind, you have the roaring, you have the floods, you have the raging of the sea, you have everything that these verses are talking about, and it's relating them to spiritual forces that God is releasing and is going to release in the last days. Jeremiah 25, verse 31. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Man, when you just believe the Bible, and you believe that God will operate through the pages of this book, you see what's going on, and you're going, that's God. God is doing this right right now. He is. Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, here again, I'm showing you the sp that these whirlwinds are connected. And I don't believe just symbolically. I mean, I believe literally, physically. I believe that these whirlwinds, tornadoes, these strong, destructive winds, God is releasing evil spirits. And this is what they do. This is how they work. We see the visible evidence of their working as they destroy, um, as they destroy mankind, as they destroy man's property. They just bring destruction and chaos and floods everywhere they go. Look at Ezekiel chapter 1. And I looked, and behold, a, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire unfolding, un, unfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. Out of the midst thereof was as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. And so even these good angels, the, the cherubs that with the throne of God, Ezekiel describes them as their motions and their appearance and their movement as a whirlwind. We, we saw earlier that their wheels look like a whirlwind, whereas a whirlwind, and we see the wheels associated with Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, go watch the video we did called uh, UFOs, Chariots of the Beast. And I deal more with these chariots and the idea of these wheels and, and, and the nature that they represent. Look in uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. That overflow idea is a, is a flood term. You ever overflowed the bathtub or the sink? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Job chapter 1, verse 19. Behold, this is the judgment. This is uh, God letting Satan do to Job what Satan wanted to do, and that is destroy everything he had. Because God said, does Job worship you for naught? Yeah, you made him rich. Let me take away all this stuff, and we'll see what happens. So God said, okay, Satan, you can do this. Look at what the devil did. Behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. For the spiritual nature, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why that number is there, to show you the spiritual workings of Satan against Job. Did Job survive it? Yes. Did God bless him? Absolutely. Ezekiel 37, 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. The four winds are spiritual forces now. There's good and bad. There's good and then there's bad. And these spiritual things, these spirits, the four winds, are coming in, they represent the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They represent the means of God's salvation to mankind. These are the things like a wind that are coming into. What happened on the day of Pentecost? They heard a rushing mighty wind, and the Holy Ghost filled them all. This is a prophecy concerning Israel and how she is going to be saved in the last days. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Think about this. Here we have four winds of the heaven. He's showing you the spiritual nature of winds and storms and whirlwinds. And he said they were striving against the sea. So the sea was 
churning and rolling and waves roaring. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Four beasts come up. The fourth one is diverse from the other three. And that's the last day's Antichrist beast that, that is going to be churned up. John said, I saw him rise up out of the sea. What happened to that sea? The whirlwinds came and chopped the water up, strove upon the waters. That's what happened. Uh, look in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. You know what the trumpet is? Trumpet's the, the Bible. Okay? His angel, the four angels from the four winds, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to gather together his elect. And so we absolutely see that there is a definite spiritual connection between whirlwinds, tornadoes, winds, destroying winds, blessing winds, winds that bring in rain. We see that there is a spiritual connection with this. It's like they're just, when angels move, this is how they work. Uh, now, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. This, speaking of the trumpet gathering together his elect from the four winds, look at 2 Kings chapter 2. Elijah. Verse 1 says, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And then in verse 11, And it came to pass... As they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Look at the language of this. God is promising, now you listen to this. God is promising that because of the sinfulness of mankind, God is going to release a whirlwind on the earth to give them what they got coming. It's the whirlwind that takes Elijah up into heaven. You think about this. As God pours out uh, his judgment, his wrath upon the earth, God's people are taken. What is it that destroys earth is what takes us into heaven. Think of the ark, the days of Noah. Think of the floods. What was that destroyed the earth? is what lifted up and saved those that were in the ark. God, God just does it that way. Am I, afraid of the, am I afraid of the New World Order? No. Am I afraid of the Illuminati? Nah. You see, even if, and let me just kind of, let me play your advocate for a second. Um, even if you think that the government has superpowers and that they used an antenna array called HARP, I mean, it's there. I believe in HARP. I don't know exactly what it's for. There's been a lot of speculation, but the truth is we don't really exactly precisely know. We haven't seen the HARP manual leaked from the government. Okay? The guy who controls all the knobs and switches of HARP, we haven't seen the memo that he got. So we don't know for sure. But let's say that maybe, maybe, there is some kind of weather control going on by the Illuminati. Who let them do it? Who let them have the information? Who let them have the knowledge on how to do this? Ultimately, it all goes back to God. It's there. Everything's in his hand. It's in his power. It's in his control. So I'm not afraid of the Illuminati. I'm not afraid of the... Um, the New World Order. I'm not afraid of who's going to become president. I'm not afraid of how bad the country's getting or how bad the world's getting. Because one of the things that I know absolutely, positively for sure, that when this world goes down, you and I go up. I have great confidence and have great hope in that. Um, Isaiah 41, 29. Behold, they are all vanity, their works are nothing. They, their molten images are wind and confusion. Now we have a direct connection between Baal. And you're going, ah, I knew the Freemasons were in. No. We have a direct connection between spirits and spiritual forces and gods and idols and 
Baal and things like that with the wind and with the confusion that it brings. You see, here's, here's something I want to help you with, okay? If you want to go to heaven for all of eternity, you have to believe in God, you have to believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, you have to believe what the Bible says. Now, in order to go to hell, you have to worship Lucifer, somehow, some way. But it's really interesting that in worshiping Lucifer, here's the only rule about worshiping the devil that you need to remember. You don't have to think that you're worshiping the devil. Isn't it, isn't it something? You don't have to believe in him. You don't have to believe he exists. You don't have to believe in hell. You don't have to believe in anything. You just have to do the sins which by nature come natural for practically all mankind. That's all that has to happen. And so, are they worshiping Baal, worshiping false gods down in New Orleans? Boy, are they ever. Now, if you were to go down and ask them, are you Satan worshipers? Now, you're probably going to get some of them that are going, well, yeah. Because New Orleans, by, by and large, is a very evil place. It is very evil down there. New Orleans, Louisiana is not known as the Bible Belt of America. And so you understand that even though they don't, may not regard any kind of God in their mind, they're practicing his religion, not his. His. So you understand that. And so God issues a warning. He sent one in 2005. He sent another one seven years later. Same day, same place. Now, if you remember from our uh, video, Jesus Christ, DNA, the Holy Bible, um, you understand the, 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 the design. Here's a picture of a hurricane. And they all look alike. I mean, every one of them look alike. You have a spiral. Notice you have a, a, just a series of spirals. And it starts tight in the middle, works its way out in sort of a circle, and you can see that where the circle begins in the middle and unfolds itself, the circle pretty much ends in the same general place that the circle began. It just kind of, where it starts, it just kind of ends right there. There's a, that, that pattern is repeated all throughout the universe. It's known as the Fibonacci sequence. Let me go back over this again very quickly. And if you want more on this, the video Jesus Christ DNA and the Holy Bible will go into more depth about the Fibonacci pattern. It's called God's ratio, the golden ratio, Fibonacci sequence called by many names. But really it's, it's God's signature on everything he created. Uh, when you flush the toilet, the water makes that same spiral. So go home, go in the bathroom, flush the toilet and go, oh wow, look at that. Okay, fill the sink up with water, pop the cork. When the water starts going down, it goes down in that same spiral. You'll see it like that. Go to the beach. I wouldn't go to New Orleans right now or Gulf Breeze or any place like that. But you go to the beach, and when the waves co are coming in, they curl. And they curl, and that curl is exactly like this. And it tails out on the water, pretty much the same place it started. It's, it's universal. It happens. Your ear does the same thing, has a Fibonacci spiral in it. So I want you to look at this. Now, if we were to take this pattern, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and so on. Here's the pattern here. The two numbers, 1 and 1, are in sequence, okay? And we put a 0 at the beginning just to make it simple. 0 plus 1 is 1. So notice that we have two numbers, and the third number after them is the sum of the two previous numbers. 0 plus 1 is 1. Now we have 1 and 1. 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's the ne next number in the sequence. Now we have 2 and 1. 2 plus 1 equals 3. 2 plus 3 equals 5. 3 plus 5 equals 8. 5 plus 8 equals 13. So that's the pattern, and it just keeps going ad infinitum. There's actually a uh, mathematical ratio, if you understand about that. Some people do. I had a guy come to me in Rochester, and I was, I'm not a mathematician. I mean, I am not a mathematician. I had to really go over this to comprehend it. But I, expl I try to plan explain it simply. And I had a guy sitting in the audience. I mean, the guy is a mathematical genius. And I'm explaining the Fibonacci sequence. And he comes to me with a piece of paper like this. And he says, here it is. 
And there is like signs and symbols and numbers and Greek letters and formulas everywhere. And he said, this is how it breaks down. See? And I went, <laughs> I don't know what that means. But he got it. He got it from a mathematical level. But you can understand that 1 plus 1 equals 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on. That's how, the ratio is 1.618, blah, 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 to 1. And so if you take the ratio, and when you get up into the hundreds and the thousands in the Fibonacci sequence, if you take this number and divide it by the previous number, the answer is going to be 1.618 or right around in there. So it's a consistent ratio that no matter how big it is, the ratio remains the same. And that is God's signature. So when I, when I see a hurricane shaped like this, I'm going, that's God. God did that. It's in a very ordered pattern and it's the same pattern no matter where you go. When you apply these numbers into that spiral, when the, where the spiraler begins, you see the boxes there, one and one. Those boxes, let's say, would be one square inch. And then the next box in the sequence is going to be two square inches. The next box is going to be three. Notice that the three box covers the size of the two box and the one box. And then you have the next number in the sequence, 2 plus 3 equals 5, and it's curving around. 3 plus 5 equals 8 square inches, and then 5 plus 8 equals 13. And then for some reason, all of these spirals, no matter how big they are, how small they are, for some reason, all these spirals just kind of tail off at that same point. And I'm going to show you why here in a little bit. Okay? Here it is, if we look at a, an image of a hurricane, you plainly see the signature of God in this spiral, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and then in the place that it starts, it tails off again. You see that. When you look at a spiral galaxy, it starts out in the middle, tails off in the same place that it starts. It's the same Fibonacci patterns, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And again, no matter how big or how small it is, that's God's signature. It's his hand. He made the stars, and he went like that. And they all just made that same pattern. There's billions, trillions, untold gazillions of spiral galaxies all over. The, and, and by the way, stars are angels, according to the Bible. That's what they are. Even the, We've talked about the zodiac and how it's the constellations, and they represent stars. The zodiac are, is like the circle of living creatures. They represent evil angels that are encompassing the wicked of the earth in the last days to bring about a new world order. That's, that's their purpose. That's their goal. So I want you to understand this. When we're looking, at, we're looking at stars, we're looking at hurricanes or tornadoes or anything like that, we're looking at God giving us a visual symbol of spiritual forces at work. And here's, here's why I'm saying all this. There is in the occult world a symbol. Now, those of you who have followed our ministry, you know I, I, when I see symbols, I go, okay, yeah, I know what that is, I know what that is, yeah. I've studied symbols for years, and God has helped me with my understanding of symbols because I believe this book. I believe that this book will, will reveal. Let me, let me do it like this. Here is Albert Pike, and he's got a symbol on the front here. It's a double-headed eagle, and we've got all these stars here, which is like 33%. There's like 33 stars here, and that's like one-third. Think of one-third of the stars of heaven being cast down to the earth. We have ordo ab chao. Wow, what does that mean, ordo out of chaos? You know what chaos means? The pit. The bottomless pit. Um, it has a crown. It has a little triangle at the top. And it has a number in here. This is really, really interesting. What this, number, this number is actually related to what I'm talking about today. And so what does this symbol mean? And so if you read 800 and some odd pages of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, let's see how many do I have here. We have 800 and, this is the index in the back, by the way, 850 some odd pages in this book. You will never, ever, 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 ever find out the truth of what this symbol means, because Albert Pike says in this book, he says, uh, we use symbols like the square and the compass and the handshakes and crossing our legs and, you know, the furniture of the uh, Masonic Lodge um, in 
we tell you what we want you to think they mean in, in the blue lodge in the first three degrees we lied we weren't telling you the truth we're not really going to tell you what they mean so their job is to conceal a secret God's job is to reveal secrets so when I see symbols I don't care what it's on I think there's something hidden behind I mean it's just it's just how God trained me so I see symbols I see a spiral I see what they call a sacred spiral sacred spiral has been around thousands of years there's ancient artwork you probably could google this and you'll find the sacred spiral uh, it, it kind of looks like a maze or a labyrinth the labyrinth has the same concept the same idea you're going down to the center is what you're doing but a sacred spiral is and it's heavy in the new age uh, there are churches the, the Mormon uh, the Mormon temple in st. Joseph Missouri where they believe that Jesus is going to come back once we get a Mormon president um, I don't know if they really believe that but this certainly matches their goal the Mormons they believe that Jesus is going to come back he's going to rule in New Jerusalem in Independence Missouri and they have built a temple in honor of this that has the sacred spiral coming out of the roof I get it I understand what that is I understand what that sacred spiral you'll see you'll see symbols like on a hand with the spiral you see there in the, in the graphic there you see the sacred spiral there and I I understand I get it I know what this is talking yet let's go back to this verse here Hosea chapter 8 verse 7 for they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind they're going to reap what they sowed think of lust when it is conceived bringeth forth sin sin when it is finished bringeth forth death see the see the terminology here okay the seed goes in and what seed was put in is what comes out it's just like a man or a woman it's just like an animal in the animal kingdom. it's just like in all of nature what you sow is what you're going to reap America and the rest of the world and America and the rest of the world sows to the wind they excuse me, I'm gonna say this the Bible way we have sown the wind and we're gonna reap the whirlwind this whirlwind is a symbol of the beast Revelation 13 the Antichrist the, the of, of first John the uh, son of perdition second Thessalonians 2 the um, the king of the bottomless pit Revelation chapter 9 I'm gonna show you this um, there's a book called the divine pymander now I don't have a copy of this I haven't read it but uh, Manley Hall refers to it in um, the secret teachings of all ages and he refers to the divine pymander this book and the divine pymander is a is like a lost hidden secret thing that was given to a character by the name of Hermes Trismegistus Hermes is the um, is the thrice majestic one two three lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life that's what he represents Hermes Trismegistus is the Antichrist and Hermes Trismegistus represents the lost word that is, is buried with him a secret and it's going to come up out of a KO one of these days It's going to come up out of the pit It's going to bring in a new world order so you understand what this is all about and the divine pymander describes sort of the the calling of Hermes Trismegistus um, I think Manley Hall made the reference to Hermes the name being associated with the Masonic Hiram Abiff they're all the same Hiram Abiff basically is the guy who can rebuild temples think about that and Hiram Abiff had a secret and he was he was struck three times he was slain he's buried in a pit and he's going to be resurrected by the lion I think I get it I think I understand who that is here is what and and I haven't read all of the divine pymander and I'm just kind of grasping a little bit of what this is about but I want to show you because it references the association between the idea of the Antichrist the beast or this thing that's going to come out one of these days with 
the whirlwind or the sacred spiral. That's what, when you see this in the New Age or when you see this in ancient uh, uh, occult art or anything like that, this is what it's referencing to. There is a great dragon. Think about that. Who's the dragon? That is teaching Hermes Trismegistus how, how the, the world was created and the purpose of the world and the purpose of Hermes and the great secret. So here's what it says, and this is according to Manley Hall. In this manner it was accomplished, O Hermes, the word moving like a breath. This is the lost word. This is not Christ. Moving like a breath, remember, think of wind and air. Through space called forth the fire by the friction of its motion. Therefore, the fire is called the sun of striving. Stop right here. Because it's the, the four winds striving against the great sea that brings up the four beasts. So when you read this, you're going, oh, that's in the Bible. It is. So then continue on. It says, the workman passed as a whirlwind through the universe, causing the substances to vibrate and glow with its friction. The sun of striving thus formed seven governors, the spirits of the planets whose orbits bounded the world, and the seven governors controlled the world by the mysterious power called destiny given them by the fiery workmen. When the second mind, the workman, had organized chaos, the word of God rose straightway out of its prison of substance. Think about it. It's when, when the great work is completed, the word, they call it the word of God. It's, not, it's the opposite of Christ. It's another Christ. Is what it another Jesus. It rises up out of its prison of substance. Think about that. That's a description of the Antichrist. So he mentions the actions of the whirlwind causing this thing to happen, the creation or the formation of seven governors. Remember the beast. He has seven heads. The dragon has seven heads. And there's always this saying in the scripture with this number seven, that when they talk about the seven planets, the sun, moon, and all the way down, all the planets down through Saturn, that they say are actually in, they're the forces that are in control. This would be the spirits that are controlling the Illuminati, the spirits that are controlling and bringing about the new world order, these seven spirits. They are the exact opposite of the, Seven spirits of God, mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And here are the seven spirits of God, all in one verse. The spirit of the Lord, that's his name, shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Those are the seven spirits of God. That's what Jesus comes to bring to mankind. And when you are saved and you're born again and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, you have those seven spirits in you. You know who God is. You know who His Word is and you have a fear of the Lord. These seven anti-spirits are what's represented by the seven heads of the beast, the seven planets, the seven forces, the seven governors that are controlling the world. This is none other than the spirits of Antichrist that are working in the world right now and they're working through the whirlwind. Wow. Think of um, Nebuchadnezzar, who had a beast heart given to him for seven years. And it's a prophecy of times to come. That's what this whirlwind represents. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 41, verse 30, there shall arise after them seven years a famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And so you think of this seven, the seven, God judged the world for seven years, and yet God saved his people out of this. You think about it. In Egypt, there was food because of Joseph. Joseph was sent before to bring salvation to his people during this. God knew it's coming, and God's got it all. God's got your salvation all worked out. I love that. I live by that. I absolutely love that. So I want you to think of this number seven. Katrina, seven years later, to the day, Hurricane Isaac. And somebody had mentioned to me, and I mentioned this in a live broadcast this week, Isaac, the name Isaac, that's the Bible name. 
It means laughter. And you read Psalm chapter 2, and you, the Bible says God shall laugh at them. He has them in derision. It's God laughing at the world because they're forming right now a conspiracy against the Lord and against his anointed, and it won't work. God's too powerful. What's, what force on the earth could have stopped either one of these hurricanes? Not one. But here's something interesting related to this number seven. I want to take you back to this idea of the Fibonacci sequence in the hurricane. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. Because when the sequence starts, it always tails off and ends at this point here. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. How many fingers am I holding up here? Seven. The sum of the first seven numbers of the Fibonacci sequence, 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8 plus 13, is 33. That's that number right here. And that number is a number related to the Antichrist. You say, ah, no, Jesus. And Jesus died when he was 33. Do you know why? you know why? Because Jesus was taking his enemies, making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in his cross. Jesus knew that this number, and you break it down to threes, and there you are back again, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It all breaks down. That's why there's a triangle there. That's what it represents. This is the man of sin. This is his symbol. This is one of his numbers. There's a number, number 666, and we'll see that. But that's one, and there's other numbers associated with that. But I want you to get this. When I, when I see this, I mean, here's a graphic of it here. Order of KO, same thing that's on the cover of the book here. Um, that number 33. And so we're understanding now that this hurricane or hurricanes or whirlwinds are figurative of the coming of the Antichrist. Um, this week, I was going to, and when, I, when it dawned on me the significance of this, I thought, you know, I have to do this. I was going to show you the significance of the closing ceremony of the London Olympics. We're going to have to wait on that one. But at the end of the closing ceremony of the London Olympics, there was a bird that came out of like this fire. That's the phoenix. That's pretty much the same thing as this is. The phoenix is a symbol of the Antichrist. And probably in the very, very near future, I'm going to show you what I have found concerning that symbol. But we are being inundated right now with warnings and signs all around us that there's something happening, something going to happen. I don't know when. But it could be very soon. And I think people ought to get ready for the destroyer because he's coming. Let me make, let me make a note of this here. Uh, the two heads of the eagle, you see it here in the graphic here, the two heads of the eagle, um, Albert Pike says, and all the other occultists, they say the same thing. They represent east and west. Uh, they represent two opposite directions, future and the past. They represent uh, left and right. They represent earth and heaven fused together in the same body, or a spirit and a mortal together in the same body, or they represent the male and the female coming together. And we all know what that is, okay? That's what that represents. So think of it like this. Genesis chapter 6, you have the sons of God and the daughters of men. And they came together and produced a child. That child, or they produced children. The fruition of that is going to be the Antichrist, and that's what this symbol represents. So I want you to think now along these terms. And maybe I'm making too much of this, but I, I think that we're right on here with our understanding of the symbolism of this because they give hurricanes names. Now, back when I was a young one growing up, they were all women's names. They just, somebody decided at one point to name them all after women. Well, the 70s, you know, you had the women's lib movement, and so they said, that's not fair. We want to name them after men, too. So they started naming one. They named one after a woman, one after a man, one after a woman, one after a man. And it fluctuates every year. 
But I want you to just think about this. Two hurricanes on the same day, crossing paths, same place, on the same day, seven years apart, and one's a man and one's a woman, male and female, together. Okay? And I want you to just kind of think of that for a second. Um, you have the numerological significance. And let me, let me explain numbers for a minute because this is what really got me going. This is what I'm going, you know what, I need, to, I need to talk about this. I think there's something major as far as the symbolism of these two hurricanes, seven years apart to the day in the same place, male and female coming together. In the occult world, uh, if you understand a little bit about numerology, and I don't study numerology, I don't practice it. I believe that God uses numbers in the scripture. That to me is clear, and I try to show people the, the, the biblical significance of numbers. Seven is the number for completion and perfection. God's, God's saying, I'm done. It's over with. Genesis chapter 7, God finished the earth with a flood. He said, I'm done. The, number eight is number for new beginnings. So seven days in a week, the week ends, and you start all over again. And in Genesis chapter 8, eight people walk off into a new world. So I, I get it. I mean, God uses those numbers. In the occult, they, they use numbers, but they hide them because everything in the occult world is hidden. And so you may not see the number 666 anywhere. But if you see a hexagram here and a hexagram here and a hexagram there, which is a six-sided figure, if you see three of them together, that's what you have, 666. You have that number. If you see two triangles together, even if they're side by side or one pointing up, one pointing down, you have the number 33. That's what you have, or 3 plus 3, or however you want to look at it. Letters. Letters in the occult world are often hidden by, or numbers are often hidden by letters. I'll say it that way. And let's make it real, real simple. A equals 1, B equals 2. Let me show you how this. Let me show you the graphic of the square and the compass. And it has the letter G in it. And everybody's trying to figure out what this letter G represents. And they say, well, we say it represents uh, geometry. Remember, they're lying. Could represent God. Well, it could very well be. But let's do some counting. A, B, C, D, E, F, 7. That's what it represents. The seven spirits of, of the Antichrist, the seven heads, his dominion, his total dominion over all mankind. At the end of time, that's what it represents. The seven-year span of the, of the famine in, in Egypt. The seven-year span of the two hurricanes to the day coming at the exact same place, male and female together. And there's that number seven again. And I just... I don't know. I guess I just think this way because I'm going Isaac and Katrina. Isaac and Katrina. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. I is the number nine. J, K is the number 11. Nine, 11. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Remember the Kao, the abyss, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and that word means destroyer. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, and that name means destroyer. Think about it. We have a video called The Beast of 9-11. And, uh, and I'm going to kind of go back over some of the information that's in that video because I think it's relevant to what we're seeing here. Uh, in the Muslim world, they pray a rosary. And that rosary, sometimes it will have 99 beads on it, which is 9 times 11, or sometimes it will have 33 beads on it. Think about that. And you're to pray them three times. And it represents what they call the 99 names of Allah. And it's interesting that one of the names of one of the 99, 9 times 11, 33 times 3, names of Allah is 
Al Mumat, the destroyer, the bringer of death. Guess who Allah is and his nine times eleven names? I showed you in that the great seal, and not the, necessarily the one on the back of the one dollar bill, but the, the real great seal. There's actually a, a die in Washington, D.C., I think it's at the State Department, that is the official seal of the United States of America, and every letter that's sent from this country to another country, a foreign you know, exchange of this is what our country thinks of your country or whatever, every letter sent from the State Department gets sealed with this seal. And I noticed that on this seal, it's been around since 1904, that the tail feathers of this phoenix, eagle, is nine and 11. Interesting. Uh, we did a video on um, the uh, Temple of the Antichrist. In fact, we actually have a book uh, that you can get from our ministry. It's called Capital Secrets, the Temple of the Antichrist, Lincoln Memorial. Lincoln Memorial, I found out that the pillars that surround the Lincoln Memorial, they're exactly 99 feet tall. Or excuse me, wait, 99 inches, something like that. Not, not, no, it's got to be 99 feet. Nine times 11. That's how tall they are. That's what surrounds this, that number, 911. And then, when September 11, 2001 happened, um, I started seeing some things in movies, and I'm going, man, they predicted 9-11. I was a little short-sighted in that. I thought they were talking about September 11, 2001. I didn't know that they were talking about something. And this is where I'm going with this, the two hurricanes, the 9 hurricane and the 11th hurricane, coming together seven years apart on the exact same day at the same place, male and female together, and their numbers like are 33 all over the place. Sevens and 33s and nines and 11s everywhere here in a symbol that is all throughout the scriptures. It means something. And I think all of this, including September 11, 2001, is pointing us in the direction, we can see it in the Bible, of the whirlwind that is going to happen, the destroyer that is coming up out of the pit. Um, you ever seen a, the symbol of it? I just thought of this, the cornucopia. You've seen that symbol? The cornucopia is it's called the horn of plenty. Think of a horn, like a lamb's horn or, a, or a, a ram's horn. It has the same Fibonacci spiral. And when you see a cornucopia, you have basically it, at the mouth of it, it has this offering of fruit and food and delicious things. And this is like gives you life. That's, that's symbol of the cornucopia is the same idea. It's out of this whirlwind comes life for all mankind, a new world order. But we know that the Bible says it's going to bring death. Um, we saw in the movie The Patriot, and at the end of the movie, page, you've got to see this, at the end of the movie, The Patriot, they talk about you know, this war and the revolutionary war and revolution and everything like that. What's it all about? And they mention on there that it's about they can build a new order as a result of this. And at the opening scene, here's Mel Gibson, and he's got this, he's got this rocking chair that he's trying to build, and um, he weighs it, and he says in the movie, nine pounds, 11 ounces, that's perfect, perfect. And he gets it off the scales, and he sits on it, and he goes, <laughs> it's destroyed. The movie Independence Day, that number, they just flash that number on the screen, and then there's a destruction. The movie Armageddon, the spaceship is going to take off and save the world from falling stars. You see the number 9-11 there. Uh, the 1990 movie Gremlins, it's about these little devils running all over the place. You see the numbers 9 and the number 11. The movie, 1998 movie Enemy of the State, the antagonist or the bad guy of the movie is born on 9-11. <laughs> The 1990 movie, Problem Child, think about that one. His address is 9-11. Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Caution, 9-11. 1997 movie, The Peacemaker, 9-11. The Simpsons, New York, 9-11. The movie, Godzilla, the remake, the American one, 9-11. 
A movie called The 13th Floor. There's a number for you. Notice that one hand's on the 9, one hand is on the 11. Mr. Anderson from The Matrix. Oh, look. Look when he was born. 9-11. No, I don't think he was born there, but I think there's like an expiration date here of 9-11, September 1st, 9-11. A movie called Traffic from, from the year 2000. These crates are marked with a 9-11 and they have a scorpion on them. Go read Revelation chapter 9. You'll get it. Rocky. And I'm going, oh, they didn't mess with Rocky. Okay, like one of the greatest boxing movies ever made. The, one of the characters in the Rocky series was a, a boxer by the name of Apollo Creed. Apollo, Apollyon. That's his name. And he is called the King of Sting and the Dancing Destroyer. That's what, that's what the beast is. And he's coming like a whirlwind. He's coming. And I think the significance of these two hurricanes, same place, same day, seven years apart, same signature. Everything that I see in this tells me that. So, and you can think, uh, <coughs> Pastor, you've gone, you've gone nuts. You, it's, it's nothing. I hope not. I hope it's nothing. But according to the scriptures, there is a storm coming, and it's meant to wake the people up to their sinfulness and follow the Lord. Let me read you one more verse. Le Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 18. This is what God said to Israel. He said, I'm giving you my laws. I want you to live by them. But if you don't, and I know you won't, here's what I'm going to do. He said in verse 18, If you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield her increase neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. You see that Fibonacci spiral the signature is 11235813. That's seven numbers in sequence. Seven numbers in sequence in a hurricane that came in 2005 and hit New Orleans, Louisiana. You, you might say the, the heart of American evil. I know it's not the only place. But if you're looking for something nasty to get into, you can get it in New Orleans. And it hits there, and God delivers this spirit, this wind, this number, this signature to this place. And America just went, oh, that was bad. Seven years later, to the day, God punished us seven times more for our sins. And if you read Leviticus 26, past verse 21, you'll see that God sends more. He's a long-suffering God. He is a very long-suffering, loving God. But some people just won't listen. I'm going to ask if you're listening. Are you listening to God? Do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Are you born again? And we use these terms, but they're biblical terms. Are you born again? <clears throat> Call on the name of the Lord. God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. God, I'm terrible. God, I don't want... I know there's something coming. I see the signs all around me. And I know your day is approaching at hand. But if not, one of these days I'm going to die. And I'm going to stand in judgment before you. God, I know this good deed stuff that I keep reminding myself that I try to do. They won't let me in. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ covering my sins will let me in. God, will you save me and forgive all my sins? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. We do that. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. 
we will see you the next time. Bye-bye.